Hi, welcome back. Today we are going to be looking at area under a curve <coughs> and how to approximate that. From physics, we learned that the area under a velocity curve is defined as the displacement. We've talked about that before in here of the car. So we're going to use area to find out just how kind of far this car traveled. And let's see here. We know it's going to give us displacement because I can look at the units. If I think of the area like little tiny little rectangles right here, that the area of this curve right here, the area of that box, it has a width of time in minutes, but has a height in meters per minute. If I try to find that area, I'm going to take that meters per minute multiplied by minute. Those cancel, and I'm left with meters here. So I know the area under here is going to give me meters, or my displacement. So to get the area, well, for the first one, we have a trapezoid. Its base has a height. So area of a trapezoid, one half. The sum of the bases, so base one is down here. It has a base of 30. Plus base two is the top here, and it has a width of 5. Multiply that by the height of our trapezoid, which is going to be 60. Plus, now this one gets a little bit tricky because I just found the area of my trapezoid. Now we got to find the area of our triangle. But we have a problem with the triangle. This is my velocity graph. So we've talked about this in particle motion. Above, we know velocity is positive, and below, velocity is going to be negative. So when I want to find the area, it's going to be negative one half. It is a triangle, the base. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And the height of our triangle is 40. Now, I know it says negative 40, but I put my negative here. And again, it's negative because we're below. And I am going to cheat. I am going to type this in on my calculator and see what we get here. Uh, if I type this in, we're going to get uh, 35 times 60. So 35 times 60 times 1 half or 0.5 minus, and this is going to become 0.5 times 25 times 40. And that gives us 550. So what this tells us is that we've, we had a displacement of 550 meters. From here, I can actually do a lot with it. One, I can find my average acceleration. Acceleration is just a change in... Uh, from here, I can also do some other things from physics, excuse me. I can find my change in acceleration. Uh, I can uh, acceleration is just velocity over time. So between zero and forty, uh, okay. So between zero and where is forty over here? I just have to find my change in velocity. This is my velocity graph. So it's going to be v of forty minus v of zero over forty minus zero, and that's going to give me negative forty there minus v of 0 is just 0, all over 40, and I get negative 1. And it's velocity, so that's me I mean acceleration, meters per second, or in this case, minutes squared. Negative 1 meter per minute squared. Notice, this is just the slope of the graph, or our average rate of change. Now, later on this year, next semester, we're going to get into some more big topic. One, now, what if I want to find the average velocity of the car over the 55 minutes? Well, for this, I have to get my change in position. This is my displacement that we found earlier. That was at 550, whoop, 550 meters. And I'm going to divide that by the time, which in this case is just 55 minutes. So my average velocity, distance over time, is just going to be, what's that, 550 divided by 55? 10 meters per minute, and there is our average velocity. Now, another thing we can do later on, now let's say this car start at time t equals zero, we're at mile marker 37. Now the question says, where will we be in 55 minutes? Well, if I'm starting at mile marker 50, uh, 37, or I guess I should say, let's do meter marker, there we go, meter marker, 37, I am going to add my displacement. And which was at 550 again. And that's going to give us 
587 meters. So if, I'm, if I know where I'm starting and I know my displacement, I can find where I end up at. That's, these are two topics for much later, but for today, we are going to use rectangles to approximate area. So, what spell check doesn't catch it, don't expect me to. Most of the time, area is pretty easy to find. And up here, we saw that. We had triangles, we have rectangles, we can do circles, trapezoids. I know all those area formulas. However, what if we want to find the area under the function f of x equals x squared plus 1 on the domain 0 to 2? Enter George Riemann. Riemann! He helped to define a method for evaluation of areas under a curve by breaking the graph, the domain of the graph, into intervals of length delta x. In other words, changes in x. In the following examples, we're going to explore Riemann's method to approximate the area under a curve. So let's see here. We want to estimate the area under the curve that we talked about, the parabola x squared plus 1 on the domain 0 to 4, by partitioning it into four equal parts using rectangles. So the first thing we're going to do is how do we get delta x? How do we get that? How do we get the width of of this of our bases here? So to do that, we're going to use this formula b minus a over n, where n is the number of rectangles for us. A is where I start, b is where I end. So this is going to become four minus zero over four, which is just going to be one for us. So let's take a look here. So what is that telling us? So here we have the parabola, x squared plus 1. We want to go find the area from 0 all the way to 4. So I want to simply put what we want to do here is I want to find the area underneath this graph right here. But here's the problem. I don't know the formula for it. So this is what Riemann said. He said we can break this up into rectangles. In other words, if I can break up the region 1 to 0 to 4, break it up a little bit, I can make these little rectangles. For example, 2 is going to be in the middle, 3, and 1. So remember, we are going to make the width, the bottom width of our rectangles, 1 here. So the bottom of the width of our rectangle is going to be 1. Each one of these is going to be delta x, which is just 1. Then he says, well, now we've got to get the height of our rectangle. Well, to get the height of the rectangle, we're going to use, in this case, what's called a left-hand sum. And there's other ones we can do here. As you notice, we have a right-hand sum, and we also have a midpoint sum. A left-hand sum says between 0 and 1, which number is on the left? 0. So that says I'm going to make a rectangle at 0 like so. And I'm going to look at that rectangle. I'm going to use that area right there. And the next one says my next rectangle goes between 1 and 2. So, well, 1 is on the left. So, there's my rectangle. Then between 2 and 3, 2 is on the left. And then between 3 and 4, 3 is on the left. Now, as you can tell, this isn't going to give us the exact area, but remember, this is only an approximation technique. So the left hand says, on the domain, on the domains, we're going to pick the left one. Now, to approximate the area, we're going to use our rectangle. So we're going to write it a little bit differently here. Ready? How did I get this height here? Well, it's just the value of some c. It's just a value. So there's my height. My height, sorry about that. Our height is just a value of the function of some c value. So for the first rectangle, so we could write this as just some f of c times delta x. So to get our area, the first one, we use the value at 0, f of 0 times 1. The next one, we use the value at 1, so f of 1 times 1. My delta x is always 1. 
And in the third rectangle, we used the left-hand number, which was a 2. So it was f of 2 times 1, and then f of 3 times 1. We should have four answers here. And then I just plug them into my function. Remember what f of x was, right? It was this x squared plus 1. So I plug it in. What's f of 0? Well, f of 0 was 1, so this is 1 times 1. f of 1 becomes 2, so we get 2 times 1. And so we're looking 1 there. Plus f of 2 becomes 5 times 1. And you can add this all up. And then f of 3, whoop, forgot that one, becomes 10 times 1. And I can add those all up together. 1, 3, 8. 8 plus 10 is 18. And that's about 18 square units. It's not the exact. As a matter of fact, most of you guys can realize this is going to be way underestimated. But now let's take a look at a right-hand sum. A right-hand sum is the same thing. Going from 0 to 4, we want to estimate the area. So we're going to break it up into widths of 1 again, just like we did before. There's my delta x. It's still 1. But now I want to pick the right number. So between 0 and 1, 1's on the right. So now I'm going to make my rectangle on the right side. Between 1 and 2, 2 is on the right side. Between 2 and 3, 3 is on the right side. Between 3 and 4, 4 is on the right side. And if you notice here, this is now going to give me actually an, under, an overestimate. So that's kind of cool. So when we do this one, our area, we're still going to use f of c delta x. Remember, f of c is whatever my x value that we picked. That's just my x value there. So for the first one, we used 1 this time. Delta x is 1 plus f of, for the second rectangle, we used 2 because 2 was on the right, times 1 plus f of 3 times 1 and then plus f of 4 times 1. And I can just plug these into my function. Remember what f of x is. x squared plus 1. Plug in the 1, we just get 2 times 1. Plug in the 2, we get 5 times 1. Plug in the 3, we get 9, we get 10 times 1. Plug in the 4, we get 17 times 1. And I can add those up if I wanted to. 17 plus 17 is 34. Wow. So take a look. My underestimate is 18, but my overestimate, clearly this is going to be an overestimate for us, right, is 34. So we know the actual area has to be between 18 and 34. But we're still not done because there's one more technique we can look at, and that is what we call the midpoint sum. So a midpoint Riemann sum is the same thing, but now we're going to, between 0 and 4, this one's a little bit trickier, we're still going to make delta x is 1. But now, between 0 and 1, I want to pick the middle of it, my midpoint. So to get the midpoint, we are going to take each domain. So you can take that a plus b and divide it by 2. So if my first one, 0 plus 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. So I am actually here at 1 half. And I can draw a rectangle like so at 1 half. Now, if you notice that 1 half is kind of above and below. My next one, 3 halves. So between 1 and 2, I am going to use 3 halves. Between 2 and 3, that's 5 halves. And if you notice, this is part above, part below. So it's going to be, this is probably going to be slightly more accurate. 7 halves is my next one. There's 7 halves. There's my value. And there we go. We can get really good with fractions in here, by the way. So to get our area, same thing. We are going to take the height, f of c, times the width, which of each one of those is still going to be 1. Each rectangle is still has a width of 1. So let's see here. The first one, we use a value at 1 half times... 1 plus the value at, then we use 3 halves times 1 plus the value at 5 halves times 1 plus the value at 7 halves times 1. Now notice, you want to have this. Okay, you need that. 
And now we're going to plug in. Plugging into our function, I'll use this one up here. Bring it really good. One half squared is one fourth plus one times one. Plug in three halves. Nine fourths plus one times one. Five halves. Twenty five over four plus one. And then seven halves. Forty nine over four plus one times one. Oops, times one. And uh, honestly, just leave that alone. Don't simplify that. Just leave that. Be pretty cool. All right, going to video number two. We'll take a look at some more examples. I'll see you then.